Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, I felt the uh, energy in the room as I came in uh, and the disquiet that for the next half hour or so you were going to be talking to a lawyer, posty, uh, jockey uh, and diplomat type person. I mean, the truth is, of course, that sport in New Zealand has been phenomenally successful. It is a high-energy, highly successful environment. 89% of our kids, you all know these stats, 89% of our kids are engaging in sport at least three times a week. 74% of adults are engaging in either sport or recreational activity every week. Sport delivers billions of dollars. Uh, into the coffers of New Zealand. It involves tens of thousands of volunteers, thousands of clubs, 13 gold medals, 13 gold medals in London, over 40 medals in Glasgow, over 14 are going to be delivered, aren't they, Pete, in, um, in uh, Rio. I mean, this community is on fire. So why the hell would you end with a posty lawyer uh, racing sort of a die because everyone knows that each of those industries has its own challenges. Well, here's the thing, because each of them at their heart are world best as well. So New Zealand Post was regarded around the world, probably still is, as the best postal business in the world. And then what happened? Consumers changed the way in which they dealt with the postal business. They stopped writing letters. It's a fairly fundamental thing. Uh, we are in a postal business. It was quite a challenging thing uh, for the leadership team uh, in that business. Good news was we saw it coming, uh, which you don't always get the uh, privilege of doing, and we had time to build a bank. Uh, that's been a fantastic strategy thus far, uh, but obviously with the recent announcements about that, we're going to have to go back, to, well, I'm not going to do it, but people are going to have to go back to the drawing board and find the next uh, growth iteration, heroic growth curve uh, for the postal industry. If you think about the diplomatic world, the diplomatic world was all about having people in countries around the world that could write learned, lengthy dissertations back to Wellington on parchment uh, that would explain to Wellington what was going on in the world. Problem with that model, problem with that model was technology, because I could get that on CNN. I didn't have to go to a dip diplomat to tell me what was happening around the world. I could read all the local newspapers. So what did you have to do with that model? You had to recognise that the skill sets that had been necessary to build the best diplomatic network in the world, in my view, for a small nation, hugely valuable to New Zealand, the skill sets that have been valuable for the past were not the skill sets that were going to take us forward. We needed people who not just could write learned dissertations, but actually had insight and judgment and could discern what the value or relevance of an issue for New Zealand actually was. And then the racing industry. Undoubtedly, we have the best horses in the country, and if you don't believe that, just look what happened in Australia over the last weekend. Unbelievable. Nonetheless, I know those of you who are interested in racing will have been following it. You know we've got the best jockeys in, New Zealand, in the world, in the world well, best jockeys in New Zealand by definition, but nonetheless, uh, in the world. I mean, people like James McDonald, these are sports people par excellence. They are unbelievable uh, on the international stage. So you know that the, that the sort of core proposition for racing is really internationally competitive. But here's the thing. The industry isn't making the progress it should. Why? Because it can't get itself joined up. Because it starts battling with each other about how we share the pie rather than thinking about how we build the pie. So you can begin to understand that even though all of those organisations, those industries, were world best, are world best in their sort of heart and core proposition, they've all faced fundamental change. And you're facing fundamental change as well, as well as a drill coming through the roof. Uh, but don't worry, that could be a fundamental change for you if you're sitting immediately underneath it. The, um, you're facing fundamental change too. Uh, because your consumers are dealing with the, their engagement with sport in a different way as a consequence of technology. Because demographics in this country are changing, people are ageing, ethnicities are shifting, uh, and therefore engaging with sport is very, very different. Because money, as we've heard, it's all about money. It's not all about money, actually. It's all about passion. But nonetheless, uh, because money is getting harder to find, harder and harder and harder to find, and because competition... Uh, in the international sports stage is continuing to grow and grow at an extraordinary rate. If you look at what the UK invested per, of, uh, per medal of their uh, magnificent hall in London and you look at what we're investing, we are minnows uh, in, that investment, uh, in that investment space. Fortunately, we're smart minnows. 
uh, and that's enabled us to be successful. But the truth is that if we just sit here and bask in our own glory and say, by God, we're good, God, the stats are telling us we are fantastic, we'll be stuffed. Uh, we've seen business after business after business, self-congratulatory, delivering against whatever metrics they've got, and then up against the wall uh, very, very quickly. I thought I'd try a little uh, interactive exercise. Uh, I thought there was going to be a vast crowd, but I noticed everyone leave as I got up, uh, and uh, I do understand that. Uh, the, uh, I sympathise, actually, for it with that, but anyway, let, let's uh, just try a little interactive exercise, because I was very struck by the comment that was made by the previous uh, panellists that said you've got to have a sense of your vision uh, when you're making a, uh, making a play. What's the end game? What's the end game? So I thought we might just do a little exercise uh, which says, well, what's our view of the future of Aotearoa New Zealand, right? So here's the thing. We're going to paint a picture of the future of Aotearoa New Zealand. It is interactive. It will require you to be awake uh, and engaged and involved. Uh, I'm not an artist, obviously. I do I'm not many things, frankly. But nonetheless, I'm certainly not an artist. Uh, my sporting pedigree... Uh, uh, I noticed one of the previous speakers started with introducing his sporting pedigree. Uh, I think I'm your target audience in that non-74%, and therefore I have a lot to add uh, to this, uh, this conversation. But anyway, I'll come to that later. The, um, the, 70, the, uh, the painting the picture. All right, so I just want to, this will be very, very quick. Colours. What colours would we use if we were, just shout them out, just so, you know, this is going to be a sort of shambolic thing. Uh, gold, all right, so gold for the winning, gold for the medals, yes. 14 plus, green, green something for the nation, yeah, something for the fauna and flora of this beauty of this place, yeah, what else? Blue for the sea, yes, yes, yes. Come on. Black for the jersey, well, black because you don't think there is much of a future. <laughs> black for the, let's go for black for the jersey for a moment, yeah, for the sort of pride. Red for energy, yep, okay, yep, what else? We've got a black, green, blue thing, gold thing going, sorry? Orange, orange. is that a sort of energy colour as well? Is that why you think orange, or it's just a fantastic colour? People. Okay. Okay, shades of colour. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so something to reflect the diversity of the communities of this country and the reality of that diversity. Absolutely. Yeah, what else? White. White, the colour of opportunity, isn't it? You can paint any bloody I don't know whether you were thinking this, but nonetheless I think we're aligned. Uh, you can paint you can paint anything on white, can't you? You can do do anything with white. Yeah, okay. I don't want you going away and saying, My God, this guy he just talked at us. You just wouldn't believe it. Unbelievably boring. We never got a chance to have a word in. So if you've got a colour, shriek it. Purple, Purple a diversity colour, magnificent. OK, we'll go with those. All right, so we've got those colours going. You know, those, and these are all bold, bright colours that we've got. Now, what are we going to paint? What would the image be that we would paint uh, of the future of our country? Or images, what would you paint? The beach. The beach, OK. So we'd paint something of the beach and we'd, we'd co-fund it, wouldn't we? Uh, and um, we'd get uh, Gareth in to, uh, to, to manage beach acquisitions for us. Anyway, yes, the beach, OK. Something about the lifestyle here, the work-life balance, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, OK, the beach. What else? Vibrancy. Sorry? Vibrancy. There'd be vibrancy, yeah? OK, so the painting's going to be bright and vibrant and a vibrant beachy thing going on so far. Oh. And, sorry? Volleyball on the beach. Volleyball on the beach. OK, so volleyball. So we're into sport immediately uh, and uh, a particularly attractive sport. Some say, I don't know, but nonetheless... Uh, it, has, it attracts a certain amount of betting interest. Okay, so uh, vol volleyball on the beach, yeah, people? Mountains. Mountains, yeah, so something for the landscape. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. People, people yeah, good God, we're going to have people in our future other than volleyballers on the beach. <laughs> but I have people watching the volleyballers on the beach and looking at the mountains. Climbing yep. The mountain. Sorry, climbing the mountains. So we're going to put some plug in here for mountaineering. Uh, for that extraordinary discipline, I think, of, uh, of uh, being able to summit mountains. Yeah, what else? Right, because <laughs> where does it all start? It all starts with volunteers making sausages. Every country in the world starts with volunteers making sausages uh, for somebody. Yeah, I, I, around the world, I don't know where they are without the sausage-making volunteer. Yep, okay, so we'll have some sausage-making volunteers. Anything else? Any last images? iPhone. iPhone, something about technology. Good God, okay. So we're going to have those volleyballers, people watching, listening, playing on their iPhones, connected with the world, aren't they? That's through the iPhone-y thing going on. Yep. Last bids, children, okay, so youth. So that goes to that sort of colour, that sort of vitality, something about the youth, the diversity, the fauna and flora, the engagement with, uh, with sport and with this place, the connection with technology. And people say, 
People have said to me that getting New Zealanders to a unified vision of their future is bloody hard. They've said to me, you can't do it with a group of New Zealanders. We're two ana um, you know, anachronistic sort of people. We, we just we disagree with each other. The truth is, I reckon if you went out to any group of Kiwis and said to them, what would you want in the future of New Zealand, they would be talking about the same sort of stuff. They'd be talking about the same sort of stuff. Now, here's the thing. That future is not assured. That future is not assured. So you could say all of those things and say, my God, we're all on fire, we've got this single vision, but what might get in the way of that? Just, just shout those out. I'll do this all attractively for the moment. Uh, what, what might get in the way of the delivery of that vision? What sorts of stuff? Sorry? Working alone. So if we all work alone, we're not going to deliver that, are we? If New Zealand works alone, we're not going to deliver that. We need partnerships, we need to trade with the world. That's a small uh, TPP uh, boosting comment uh, the, for those of you that don't recognise it. Uh, you know, so, so we can't work alone. We can't circle our little wagons down here in the bottom of the South Pacific and say, my God, we're good. It would be like sports saying, my God, we're good. You have to operate in an international ecosystem. And you have to keep learning from each other. Yes, so we can't do it alone. What else would get in the way? Sea level rise. Sorry? Sea level rise. I can't. Sea level rise. Sea level rise could get in the way. So all the global warming stuff could completely stuff us. Uh, not only could it inundate low-lying areas where Aucklanders have very expensive second homes, so that is a real tragedy and challenge, but, <laughs> but it could completely stuff our agriculture. It could completely stuff our agriculture. If we, if we no longer get any rain, or if we get too much rain, if the currents and the coastal currents move 100 miles further north, or let's say 1,000 miles, 100 miles probably wouldn't make much difference, uh, you know, our agriculture is stuffed. So yes, climate, climate matters and climate change matters. What else? What else could go wrong? Poverty, so, so disparity, all of those sorts of issues, yeah, they can confront us. Yeah, geopolitical situation, the US and, the, and China and Russia, all over the world, all that sort of stuff, Trumpism, uh, and I'm not, I'm not making a comment about the validity or otherwise, but I am saying it's bloody dangerous. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the Trump thing, that whole sort of uh, personality-driven politics, that could stuff us. Uh, global financial crises that keep, to keep coming up, that could stuff us. So look, there's heaps of things that could stuff us. So we've got a positive view of the future of this place. We've done the thing about the, uh, we've set our sort of base of what we want. Now, here's the question. What needs to happen if we want to deliver that positive outcome despite all of those negative things? How do we need to work? What do we need to do? What is going to make the difference? That's a question. Just... I'm doing this interactively. <laughs> Holy hell, you teamwork. teamwork. So we've got to work as a team. It's not about a single individual. Now, there is a really radical idea. Because if you've been called a CEO, and I have now for quite a long time, people mostly laugh when they say it, but nonetheless, if I've been called a CEO and you wear a suit and a tie and you're balding and building and uh, not quite the sort of firm, fantastic shape that you once were, uh, people tend to think that you're going to be all about ego, you're going to be all about I, you're going to be all about big bonuses and big cars and big offices and big, hairy, audacious goals. And here's the thing. That model does not work in the sort of challenging world that we have seen and we see ahead. We're not going to deliver our success if we adopt that model of leadership. It's not that the command and control model can't have a place in the leadership lexicon, but it is that if you believe that you've got all the answers, if you're sitting in your office or in your, what do you call those things, module businesses that I've got now, so anyway, you know, open planisms, if you're sitting in your open planism being connected, um, with others and thinking you're going to have that momentary, you know, flash of light when all will be revealed. You'll have the vision. You'll be able to make all the decisions. You'll be able to drive things forward. Uh, then you're delusional, you're dangerous, and you'll destroy uh, your organisation. And if you don't believe me, uh, there's a marvellous book. Um, it's not, it wasn't intended to be a marvellous book, but I think it's a very interesting book, written by a fellow called Al Dunlap. Uh, this has been filmed, so Al may not like this, but nonetheless, uh, who was an American CE, and he wrote this book, and he, I picked it up in the um, remainder bin 
uh, at one of the shops at the airports that I went through over the last few years. There he was, there was Al with his chainsaw uh, on the front, telling the story of how he'd chopped through all the live wood, he'd chopped through all the dead wood, he'd chopped through every damn thing that was a very short book. There was not, but he thought he was a hero. He thought he was a hero because he'd done the chopping thing really well. Now, we all have to do that from time to time. We all have to do that sort of stuff. I'm not saying that isn't necessary, but I am saying that if it's all about you and it's all about your vision and it's not about your customers and about your markets uh, and about the country and the environment and it's not understanding technology and change, if you're not looking to partner and learn, uh, then you're not going to be successful. So, yep, that was the first one. You'll be worried now about saying any others, uh, but what else needs to happen? So we can't work alone. It's not about ego. It's about partnership. Uh, it's about working together. It's about collaborating. Communicate. We've got to be able to tell the story, don't we? And this is a fascinating thing. It is so damn hard to get the story out there. You wouldn't believe it, would you? You'd think you'd be able to tweet, you'd be able to Instagram, you'd be able to Vine, you'd be I don't know what Vine means, but nonetheless, it's a trendy word that I've heard recently. It makes me feel younger. Uh, you'd be able to vine, you'll be able to, you know, all of that stuff's available so you'll be able to get your message out. And here's the thing, I do all of that stuff. Well, I don't, my communications people do under my name. Uh, and, and nobody knows. Nobody knows about the wonder that is the New Zealand racing industry and the opportunity that is presented by it, which is true in both, um, on both statements. Nobody knows. So what is it about telling the story? How are we going to get the story told about sport in New Zealand, about how we make this the greatest sporting nation on earth, how your sporting codes and clubs can contribute to that, how we get those percentages of participation up to those incredible levels that Pete and Paul are, uh, are targeting at the moment? How are we going to do that? What needs to happen to do it differently? What needs to happen? We've got to ignite the passion. That is absolutely right. And that's why I get so depressed, even though I absolutely understand it. When we get the session after session after session, as we tend to get in these sorts of events, on the money. And the money is really important and it is really tough. And we know that Lotto is down and we know that there are, you know, all the wonderful work that's being done by the trusts to support us. So I'm not arguing about that. But I am saying if you forget that the reason that people work for you as volunteers is not about the money, uh, it's about their, um, their passion for the sport, their passion for their community, their passion for the country, uh, then you're not ever going to get past this barrier of telling the story. You've got to unlock the passion. And that means making heroes of people, and we've got great sporting heroes that we can make and talk about and put up in lights. It means making heroes of community people who are supporting your activities. So absolutely, unlocking the passion is really important. Here's the thing as a, as a leader. The way in which you act really matters. One of the things I found hardest when I, uh, when I took up well, one of my roles way back in the olden days, uh, last century, is... Uh, you're watched. You're watched. People look at you and they discern from the way you stand or the way you raise your eyes or the way you stand with your hands or whatever it is, whether you're in love with their really good idea or you think it's absolute rubbish. And they just, you know, it's, it's really bizarre and I've had this experience time and time again. So what I would say to you as a leader is be very intentional, very deliberate about your interventions. Whether it is just offering an opinion, which is often a good way of reflecting back to whoever you're speaking uh, some of the naiveties of their view without them being deeply offended by it. Whether it's just in how you ask questions, uh, which is another good vehicle in my view to be reinforcing uh, particular cultures, or it's actually in the decisions that you make, be understanding that people will be looking at that and they will be uh, dry, you know, drawing conclusions from that. So create an environment in which the passion can be unlocked. I'll give you a really good example. When Kiwi Bank was formed, um, I, I had the privilege of leading that project, although Sam Knowles absolutely was the guy who made it all, uh, made it all happen. And when we'd go around and we'd talk to people like Ralph Norris uh, at ASB or some of the other big banks, they were all up in arms about Kiwi Bank. They thought it was an appalling idea, by and large. Um, John Anderson was the only exception to that. Uh, but, um, but they thought it was an appalling idea. And they, I always said to them, look, don't worry about us. 
We're a tiny little thing. We only do a little minnow. We're just going to be out in the community doing little minnowy community type things. Don't worry about us. Uh, and in the end, when we got it through, but what I knew, I knew because I went into, the, uh, into that team. It was a small team. When we, when we launched, we had about seven people on the back of a boat celebrating. So it was a very small team. But that team was on fire absolutely on fire with the excitement of redefining banking for New Zealanders, and particularly community banking for New Zealanders. And I'm not going into whether you think it was a good model or a bad model, whether we did it well or we didn't do it well. What I'm saying is the passion was what made it effective. Yes, we'd done huge and detailed business cases. We'd had every expert on the planet, because the politicians didn't really want to do it, go over that process and go over and analyse it and do all that sort of stuff. Actually, the business case didn't survive engagement with reality. We outperformed the business case by bloody miles. Uh, the experts didn't survive engagement with reality. We outperformed the experts by miles. So I'm a big believer in the power of passion. What else are we going to do? Be bold. Be bold. It's a bloody hard thing being bold, let me tell you. I've been bold a few times in my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, most of it plays out on the front page of newspapers. Uh, and uh, so boldness is a dangerous sort of thing. Leadership is a dangerous sort of thing because boldness requires you to take decisions that won't necessarily be universally loved. You won't necessarily be universally popular. Some of the bold decisions, the right decisions, uh, to build organisations or take them forward involve real risk. And here's the thing. In New Zealand, we just hate people who take risks and fail. We just hate it. We love to take pot shots at them. People love to sit on the, on the sidelines, on the fence, and say, oh, well, you know, when it doesn't work, I always said it wouldn't work. Uh, I didn't do anything to try and make it work, of course. I actively dissed it in every opportunity I had. Round the water cooler, I was saying, what a complete loser. Uh, this guy is, how the hell did we end up with him as CE? You know, I, that's the reality in New Zealand. So, so, so being bold is not without its challenges. But in my view, if we're going to deliver that picture that you all painted together, if we're going to deliver that vibrant, bright view, we have to take bold decisions. And the thing about that for me is this. You have to do your analytical work. You have to do your analytical work. You have to have your risk management strategies. Why? Because no one will be bold if they think they're going to tip the whole organisation up. But you also have to be encouraging of failure. I, I am a serial failure. Now, I mean that quite genuinely, and that I've done heaps and heaps and heaps of things and got heaps and heaps and heaps of things wrong. And, you know, that has played out, and it's been very difficult, and it's challenging, and it, you need to personal resilience to learn to suck up all the bad news and ride it out and take the long-term view and all that sort of thing, divorce the role in the person, all that sort of good advice that you read in the book, which is actually bloody hard to do, divorce the role in the... Anyway, uh, but the point is, in the end, it's this simple. You have to back yourself, and you need a really good team around you to ground you. And you, I don't just mean your family and whānau, you do need that. I mean the team that you put together around you. You have to have a culture where people are prepared to critique you, they're prepared to challenge you, they're prepared to disagree with you. Why? Why is that important? People challenge, disagree, whatever. Why would that be important? Because otherwise, you get completely out of touch, you get completely egotistical, you get consumed by your own magnificence, you think every idea is a bloody winner, which it absolutely won't be, uh, and you're less successful than you would otherwise be. So, be bold, but be ready, and be resilient, uh, would be my message on that one. Right, okay, so we're going to be, we're going to be bold, uh, we're going to be joined up, and there was, what was the other one? What was the one in the middle? Sorry? Oh, we're going to, and we're going to communicate really effectively. What else needs to happen? Learn. We've got to be a learning organisation. So you think, about, you think about the world we're working in. You think about the diversity and challenge and change of what's going on, the speed of technological change, the speed of geopolitical um, change, uh, just the, the speed with which demography in New Zealand is driving uh, change in who we are uh, as a country. And you know that the only way you can, do, you can respond to that is if you're open and learning. I, I call it intellectual curiosity. In my view, the mark of a leader, the most important mark of a leader, of all the other things, all the character and the accountability, I'll talk about those things in a minute. But the real mark is intellectual curiosity. And by that, I do not mean an MBA. 
uh, although you might be intellectually curious and have an MBA. I've met many who have an MBA who have not the slightest interest in anything, as far as I can tell, uh, other than getting an MBA uh, and then finding a job. But, but, but you know, what I'm talking about is being interested in stuff in new thinking, in new ideas. And what does that mean? It means you're probably a reader. Whether you're reading blogs and whatever, or books, I don't really care, magazine articles, uh, graphic novels, I don't care, but you'll probably uh, be a reader. You will absolutely be a person who's interested in diverse people and thinking styles within your team because you know that you're not going to be able to cope. You're not going to know everything that's going on. You can't possibly know everything that's going on. So you need to get diversity in your team so that you get those different thinking styles, different approaches, different experience to inform uh, your decisions. And it's really tough. I can tell you this. I've built many, many, many teams. And it's hard to get the perfect team. Uh, and you go through all kinds of processes and you do psycho psychological things and all kinds of stuff. And I know that's, you know, the elite sports do that all the time, don't they? So, so you'll be familiar with it. But, but, you know, all of that, and then you, you get your team together. And often, if you go back and then psycho-test them, you do the Myers-Briggs or one of those sorts of things, turns out they're all like you. Turns out they're all... Now, they won't all be ageing, they won't all be fattening, but they will tend to be pretty close to you in those sorts of drivers. So it is really, really hard and really, really important that as an intellectually curious person, you create a culture and a team that supports and drives that intellectual curiosity. You've got to be a learner. If you're not a learner, you'll be a lovely person, but you won't be a leader. Um, I'd rather you were a lovely leader. Right, what else is going to get, what else is going to get us there? Adaptable. You've got to be willing to change, don't you? There's a marvellous poem. Uh, I knew I'd introduce poetry at some point because Peter asked me to. Uh, and, and there's a marvellous poem by a guy called Glenn Colquhoun. And I've talked about Pete, to Pete about this before, and he actually reminded me of it when he was telling me that he was asking ask me to speak. Uh, and it's a little, a little poem, and it has the line, it's called The Art of Walking Upright. Glenn Colquhoun's a doctor, um, lived in Auckland, went up to Napui in the far north and wrote a, a book of poetry called The Art of Walking Upright, Art of Standing Upright Here. And the poem goes like this. There's just two lines out of it. I won't give you the whole thing because I don't know it. Um, the, uh, but oh, there's just two lines out of it. It says this. The art of standing upright here, that standing upright in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is the art of standing on two feet. One is for holding on and the other is for letting go. And I, in terms of adaptability, that seems to me to be absolutely what adaptability is all about. It's about understanding what is good and solid and what you need, you know, what you draw from your own experience, from the place that you're leading, from the time that you're leading, from history, from all of that stuff that you can anchor and hold solid. But, and here's the adaptability piece, you've got to be prepared to leverage, well, I, I find it difficult to stand at the best of times, but uh, leverage off that solid leg uh, and take a step. Otherwise, you don't go anywhere. So you've got to be prepared to adapt. You've got to be prepared to shift and change. People say to me, is a leadership style born or made? You know, I had that question just the other day, actually. Someone said to me, well, you know, you've, you don't like, you, I, don't, I don't dis, um, you know, command and control leaders, but I just say they're not likely to be effective in the modern world. The, um, but, but, you know, if you're a command and control le leader, can you, re can you reinvent yourself? Well, here's the thing. I was a lawyer. I was a lawyer, and I became a partner in a law firm, which meant I had about two people. Well, as a lawyer, you have nobody. You're just a technical sort of expert, and I love being a little technical expert, doing little technical legal things. And then I became a partner, and I got a little team. And then the most extraordinary thing happened. I did some work for New Zealand Post, uh, and I worked on the deregulation of the letter market. Wait, this is a long time ago. And then the then chief executive of New Zealand Post said, why don't you come and lead the letters business? And the letters business had 5,000 people in it. I had not an idea what to do. I, I said yes, of course. Uh, but I had not an idea um, what to do. And so I bought a book on economics because I couldn't understand what they were talking about around the, around the leadership table. They were talking about EVA and P&Ls and stuff. Le lawyers don't know anything about any of that sort of thing. Uh, well, they didn't in my day. They probably do now. And I taught myself to become part of the conversation. And then I worked out that leadership is basically about common sense and applying common sense to situations. It's about assimilating data and exercising judgment uh, to apply into those situations. 
And so, in my view, the truth is this, anyone can change their leadership style, anyone can adapt the way in which they act, but they need to be empathetic to the community that they're working in to be able to even recognise it's necessary. And they need to be, have a, 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 an environment around them that's critical of them and can be critical of them, otherwise they don't know whether they're succeeding or failing uh, in that adaptability. Now, I, fortunately, in this latest team that I have, have people who are fantastic critics of me and tell me on a very regular basis when I'm stuffing things up. I'm not sure I'm as adaptable now as I used to be. I'm in danger of becoming a grumpy old man, but uh, nonetheless... Adaptability is really important. Anything else? I don't want you to miss any. Anything else? Shared leadership. Shared leadership. So recognising the leader doesn't have all the answers. It's exactly this. Uh, and you see this. I I've, I've was on the board of Te Papa, uh, which is an absolutely astonishing uh, organisation. And Te Papa has a shared leadership model, uh, which is a, a you know, treaty-based uh, uh, shared leadership model. And it is absolutely extraordinary. So it has a CEO... And it has a kaihotu, which is the, uh, the senior Māori uh, leader of the organisation. And you would say that is dysfunctional. You can't have two masters. You can't, you know, what is it, two jockeys. You can't put two jockeys on a horse. You know, all that sort of stuff. That was Warren Buffett said that. Uh, you can't put two jockeys on a horse. He's right, actually, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's not ideal for racing purposes. But, but, but the point he was making that you can't have two leaders in an organisation or you can't have a shared or devolved leadership model is not right. Um, it, there are many, many examples. In fact, the governance model um, in the US is generally to make the CEO the chairman or president uh, of the organisation so that all power rests with that individual. Whereas the governance model, obviously, in New Zealand and Australia uh, and in uh, the UK, uh, is to divide those roles. I'm very, very clear that the divided role is a much, much stronger governance proposition, even though occasionally... If you have a difficult chair, not that I have ever had difficult chairs, which has been extraordinarily fortunate, um, but if you were to have a difficult chair, you might wish for the, uh, uh, for the Buffett model. So shared leadership and understanding that you can't do everything, that you have to devolve accountability into the organisation. You have to allow people to do things and to make mistakes. I found that hell of a hard. When I was a lawyer, I did everything. I knew the work was done to a certain standard because I'd done it. Um, it wasn't always the standard my people wanted, but nonetheless, it was, uh, uh, it was always done to a standard I was comfortable with. When, when suddenly I had to start working through teams and managing people and managing leaders, you have to sort of give up all of that stuff, all of that direct control over the doing of the work. And that is incredibly challenging, in my experience, incredibly challenging. But somehow I managed it, and the shared leadership model, I think, has real power. What else? Clarity of purpose. Clarity of purpose. So there's a real winner, isn't it? Clarity of purpose. We've heard it already this afternoon. I'm sure you've heard it time and time and time again. What is it that you're trying to achieve? What is it that this organisation is all about? What is it that this organisation does best? You need to know the answers to those questions. You need to know what your competitive proposition uh, in the market actually is. You need to know what's firing up your organisation. And you can do that with one of those very complex sort of balanced scorecards with 5,000 different propositions and a mission statement and a vision statement and some other statement. And, you know, I'm not a big believer in statements that say, you know, so what I'd describe as slogans. Um, I used to do quite a lot of work with Tim Miles at Vodafone when I was at Post, and they'd come up with this marvellous international slogan for, um, uh, for Vodafone, red, restless and rock solid. And that was laminated on the walls, it was laminated on the cards, it was sort of DNA'd into people's heads, red, restless and rock solid. What the hell is that all about? What does that mean? Why would, you, why would you get out of bed to be red, restless and rock solid? It doesn't make sense to me. Whereas a vision that says you want to inspire and enable, what is it, Pete? Inspire and enable every New Zealander or New Zealand lives, or, am I right? It's that sort of language. That sort of language, that, that sports New Zealand, obviously. I mean, you'd have all known that. In fact, if I'd asked you just to say it, you'd have all been able to say that in, in unison. But, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, there's something you get out of bed for. You get out of bed for that. When I talk about the racing industry, 
Why do people get out of bed in the racing industry? They get out of bed to support those people who are in the communities of our country, all over the communities of our country, who are getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning, the young people and the kids, and going out and working horses and the fun and the enthusiasm and the excitement they have. They get up because they know that we've got a world-class proposition and they want to be part of it. They know we've got a winning proposition and they want to be part of it. That's the stuff that inspires them. So don't, in my mind, I mean, I'm, I'm this, upset, this will upset the um, sort of PR sloganing industry, uh, which is big and quite expensive, I think. Uh, but, uh, so I'll probably be in deep trouble. But, but nonetheless, I do not recommend that you go, when you think about... Uh, how you state your purpose or what it is you're all about, I don't recommend that you go for a slogan. Do, do ask yourself, well, what is it? What really is it that gets people out of bed to come and work with you? And that's what inspires them, and that's what you need to have as your point of singular purpose. The other thing I'd say to you is be simple. Be simple. Now, that is really, really hard for someone who's trained as a lawyer, being a diplomat, I mean, least simple people and that, you know. But be simple. It's got to be able to get cut through immediately. It's got to, the reason I don't ever speak now with notes, I've given up speaking with notes, it can be quite dangerous because you get to the end of it. If you do it interactively, it's okay because someone will give you the next cue. But it can be quite a problem, you know, because you run up to the end of your sentence, you're not quite sure what the hell you're going to say, say next. But the reason I don't do that anymore is because I think it confuses the message. It doesn't help it. It's a crutch that stops you really thinking hard about what it is you want to say to an audience and connecting with the audience while you say it. So be simple in your communication. Try and get it into really simple propositions uh, that uh, basically anyone can understand. What else? Trust, did you say? Trust, good Lord. Leadership and trust. Uh, good Lord, Donald Trump. Uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, what's it called, Noir Bien, what, what debut, isn't it? Noir debut, this is the nighttime uprising in, Paris, in Fra across France at the moment. Uh, you know, elites aren't um, doing well on the trust stakes at the moment. So there's a huge, whether, whether it's because of, you know, the Panama uh, situation or it's because of sort of political views of how the US in particular and other places work, it's really, really tough to be trusted as a leader. So, what are you going to do? What needs to happen if you're going to be trusted as a leader? What are the things? Just, just shout them out. Authenticity. Authenticity. That is really, really important. That is really, really important. Why is that important? Because if you're inauthentic, it is incredibly hard to remember what the hell it is you're meant to be doing as you wander around the place. It is incredibly hard to be persuasive when you're doing it. So do try and make the messaging, the culture, all of that align with your core values. It makes life so much easier. Um, otherwise, you'd find it is incredibly difficult. And getting passion and power in the messaging uh, is all, when it's inauthentic uh, is also challenging. So absolutely, authenticity makes your life a lot easier, makes you a whole lot more effective, uh, and uh, the counterfactual is unattractive. Yep. What else builds trust? Sorry. Listen. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing I missed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Listen. Active listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being, being, listening to people. It's really, it is fundamental, isn't it? If you think about the things we've been talking about, about the challenge of absorbing information, of understanding context, of keeping up with the sort of uh, speed of change within communities, listening is just so important. It is incredibly hard. Your days are so busy. Your days are so busy, so you have to be careful and think and plan your diaries and things so that you have time to engage and to listen. You have to make sure you're out with your core constituencies as you build these uh, constituencies of interest to support you. You have to make sure you give time to that. And when you listen, what you're really doing is respecting the view of the person who is speaking with you. What we're really doing is respecting the time of the person that you're speaking, uh, that you're speaking with. And, but for me, without that sort of listening, without time allocated for listening, without being pushed out there, I'm a deep introvert. I'm a deep, 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 deep off the planet introvert. So I'm not good with people. But I have very structured time to get out there and to be engaged and to listen, and I love it. I'm fine once I'm pushed. It's just I'd rather sit in my uh, study and read my books if I possibly could. Uh, but uh, I'm fine when I'm pushed. And so structured time for me. Now, there are other people in my team who don't 
suffer from uh, introversion. And uh, for them, the challenge is processing what they hear uh, and uh, making sure they actually act on it. But, you know, different, role, different uh, personality types uh, face different challenges. There's no such thing as the perfect person. There's no such thing as the perfect leader. We all have strengths and we all have weaknesses and we all want to focus on our strengths and build a team that be deals with our weaknesses. Um, so that's why I've got a few extroverts in my team. But I agree, I agree with that, short, that proposition. What else? What else builds trust? Being honest, and consistent. Being honest and consistent. Being honest? Yeah, absolutely. It's a core attribute of character. If you're not honest, you are a fraud and people will, will you know, you won't, they won't follow you. Being consistent is really interesting, isn't it? Because consistency in challenging times, consistency in changing times, consistency is really hard to deliver in the sort of environment we're, we're creating. So here's the thing. What it really means is this. When you say something and say you will do something, you do it. When you talk about the way in which you want the place to be, the type of place it needs to be, then you will, in the way in which you walk the talk and walk out and speak and engage, you will reflect that. When something goes wrong in the organisation, you will take accountability for it, whether it is directly your fault or not, because that's the sort of organisation that, uh, uh, that you want to build. Anything else on that front, do you think? Have I missed any? Probably have. No? It's okay. All right, so what else? What, what else is going to enable us as leaders now? I, I, the trust point we, we could spend a lot of time on, because I'll just move quietly on, because otherwise time will be up. How much time have I got? Doesn't matter, I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> I'm just about, I'm only just starting really. So, okay, so, so, so apart from those things we've talked about, what else is gonna be, sorry? Reflect. Reflection, reflection, so you have to think. God, you have to think. We don't have time to think, we're doing things. We're all so busy doing things. We've got to do this and do that and do something else and we're measuring in these microsecond sort of quarter by quarter by quarter or week by week or day by day. I look at the betting performance of the uh, racing board every day. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. Betting's a volatile sort of game. And I get excited or depressed uh, depending on, the, um, on, on the, what, what the graph tells me and my betting people just completely get frustrated by that. They say it's a long-term thing. It's a long-term thing. We know what the maths tells us. The maths will out in the end. Don't fret the small stuff. So I'm getting used to that. I'm getting used to that. But it is really, really challenging to find time to think. Uh, so again, how do you do it? You structure it into your day to the extent that you can. How do you do it? You build a team around you that are going to contest your ideas, bring different perspectives. How do you do it? You're constantly out there building relationships, listening to stakeholders, engaging in the community, reading. So all of that stuff helps you think. But you do need time, and you do, I mean, I'm not a big believer in being shut away in the office waiting for the revelation, but I am a big believer in being, spending time thinking about issues, thinking about the challenges, thinking intentionally about how you are going to position yourself uh, on that stage as you move forward. Just in terms of relationships, I just thought I might make a quick comment about um, political relationships, because a lot of us uh, spend a, lo a lot of our time uh, with, um, with politicians. Uh, and it's a very strange world. I can say that having been involved in it for five and a half years uh, over the last little while. So I just, just a few quick tips on that have just sort of flashed into my mind. Uh, the first is I wouldn't recommend that you use specialist PR people to engage with Parliament. Now that's the next industry I suppose that I've just irritated. Uh, but, but the point is your message is a hell of a lot more powerful if it comes from you. Um, your message is a hell of a lot more powerful. And you can get access to any of the people that you want within the parliamentary system if you've got the right story, if you've got you know, things to actually engage them with. So I've, I know so many organisations that spend squillions of dollars engaging people and they can't understand it. They go to people who will get paid to get them an appointment uh, with a backbench MP. I can't understand it. Don't do that. You've got better things to do with your money um, than that sort of thing. The second thing uh, that I would say is understand that going to government and simply saying 
Oh, Raj is leaving. This is my head of government relations, so I'm slightly nervous. Uh, it probably means I've stuffed up in a big way by raising this point, and he's just going out to manage the inevitable problem that will be raised. Oh, time to stop. All right. Okay. No, no, I'll just finish this little point, and then we can have some more. We can have some... I'll, I'll finish this little point. So... First point, don't, don't use those PR people. I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll add value, but often they simply don't, and you don't need them. Second, don't go and ask for money. Uh, don't go and ask for money. Go and talk about how you can create additional value, how an event that you're going to host, how something that you uh, can create is going to actually add value uh, to the country. That's a, a core proposition. Three, don't forget the backbench MPs or the opposition MPs. Backbench MPs particularly important. Because ministers, not all ministers have courage. Um, I, shouldn't, I won't identify any, but not, not all ministers have courage. And when they don't have courage and you're asking them to take the lead on something uh, into the uh, cabinet or something of that kind, they need around them the support of their colleagues. So it's really, really important that when they're in caucus, they're hearing from their colleagues, my God, this is a fantastic idea. Uh, out of sports, out of the sports community. I'm really behind you on this. I really think that'd be a really good thing for my uh, constituency. Don't think all ministers are equal, because they certainly don't think they're equal. Um, they absolutely understand that there is a hierarchy. And do recognise that if you want to get things through Parliament, if your minister is outside Cabinet or is a junior minister in Cabinet, you're going to need to build a wider audience and a wider constituency. So the point about that wasn't so much about engaging with Parliament, although that's a, that's an, it is an important constituency and a lot of people, I think, waste a hell of a lot of money in the way in which they do that, but more importantly about being deliberate in your relationship building. All right, so if you build those relationships in the way we've described, you've got trust as a consequence of what we've described. We're thinking as a consequence of what we've described. We're taking bold decisions as a consequence of what we've described. We've, um, we're working together rather than in silos as a consequence of what we've described. We're learning because we're open and engaged and all those sorts of things. God damn it, we will have that bold picture. We will have that bold picture. And let me just say, to go back to my opening point, that the progress that has been made by this community, by the sports community, is astonishing that we are, I think, probably world leading on many of the metrics. There is, of course, more that we can do. There is, of course, more that we can do. But you don't need to sit here and think, God, our mod model is stuffed. You need to think, heavens, we've done a lot, but how do we just make our model right for the next step, for the next thrust into that new uh, and dynamic environment? So thank you for what you are doing. Uh, the racing industry and, and the, the racing board is, of course, a partner of Sports New Zealand. We do provide both gaming support uh, and also Class 4 support uh, and also, obviously, through our betting uh, distributions to NSOs. They are, it is unbelievable the intensity with which New Zealanders love their sport and love to put a bet on as a, as a part of that, and we're very pleased to be partnering sport uh, as we move forward. So thank you for your time. Uh, I hope some of those little vignettes may have been helpful. Uh, and all the best uh, for the challenges, the opportunities, and the success that I know you will have in 2016. Nā tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.